This is like, what is it? Uh, comedians in cars or something? Yeah, comedians in cars getting coffee. This is percussionists eating tacos. I think that sounds way better. I think we got our new show. So Matt Howard is the 26-year-old new principal percussionist in the LA Philharmonic, which is an amazing job, an amazing achievement for somebody who's that young. I wanted to ask him exactly what he did to get his job at such a young age. Now, I've known Matt for a while. He would send me Facebook messages when I was an undergrad and he was in high school and ask me things like, hey, Rob, what's your sticking for Lieutenant Kiji? How do you practice? Do you practice with the metronome? Real simple questions. I really appreciated his drive and I could tell, even though he was asking me kind of like high school questions, like when you're just starting to learn an excerpt. So he worked really hard. He practiced so much. And he told me a little bit about how he practiced. Basically what changed for him, he was at New World. He went through this process of learning how to do mental practice. He was reading books about golf and I'm gonna let him tell you more about it. But it completely changed his life. It completely changed his auditioning and immediately he won principal of the LA Philharmonic. So I was in California and I was fortunate enough a couple months ago to go check out Disney Hall and check out the percussion room and he showed me around. A company you represent. Um, visit here. Well, the Met. The Met, okay. I just put it in parentheses here, in case anyone's wondering. <laughs> Lots of timpani, <laughs> or places to put them. Oh yeah, all the tam-tams. Dude, this is awesome. Yeah, I organized the, oh yeah, check out the Jingling Johnny. It's for, it's for Berlioz, you said? So this is Joe's setup for his concerto piece? Yeah. Like, cause it's a duo, right? Yeah. That is a very strange sound. I yeah, I see. So you're you have this Einheldenleben coming up. So you, uh, oh, everyone has their own stool. What's your stool like, Matt? Um, very comfy. Nice. Very rock and socky. Does it have your butt imprint on it yet? Oh, the Mahler hammer bucket. Everyone should have a Mahler hammer bucket. Yeah. <laughs> nice percussionist dream world right here. Yeah. <laughs> this is what I wanted to take my picture with. Yeah, this is awesome. Cool. You check out all the symbols, dude. Do they come out? Oh, they like come out like drawers. Wow. All of them, man. We got uh, we had twenty a pair of twenty sixes. You have a whole twenty four inch section. Yeah. So was it just like kind of a mess when you got here? Yeah. You must be really anal to be like into this. I just hope you can keep it up. I could organize it, but I couldn't keep it up. Are they like mostly standard, like modern, uh, you can buy them off from the store kind of symbols, or are there some like really old, interesting ones? There's some like old K's. Yeah. Oh, sweet. We got some garbage can lids. Oh, what happens when you put those together? <laughs> they clang. <laughs> ah. Can you play those? I just want to hear them. Come on. Can you show us your routine? Wow. Awesome. They're on the table and then you oh, pick so them up. Yeah, just... I s put them together silently. Mm -hmm. And I'm then... We're doing it fast, but yeah, put them together silently. Drop left hand. Okay, so they're together and then you drop the left hand. I feel like it's easier to drop than it is to lift. Okay, and then do you use mostly your left hand to play or you use yeah. both hands to, okay, left hand. It's a lot of do you think that's the routine everyone should use or everyone should come up with their own variation on that? Everyone should definitely come up with their own. How do they do that? Trial and error, I'd say. Just like try a bunch of stuff. See nice. what elements need to be there and make sure that they're there and work with the variants. Do you do most of that practicing in the practice room on your own or do you like try different things in mocks? I mean, yeah. It's different doing it by yourself, but doing it when it needs to happen is different. So. Do you do the same routine in orchestra? Yes. Oh yeah. On any cymbals? Yeah. Nice. Not on Bald Mountain. I would just offset just a tiny bit more. Okay. I just make sure that when I put them together, I just notice that it's so I don't get it like... So you don't have like your own bass drum mallets that no one can use? And I mean, we do. Marching mallets. Yeah, they work great. For for what? Bass drum, just articulate bass drum stuff. Okay, not right of spring. They're too no, big for right of spring. spring. But like if you want to play like rhythms. Yeah, yeah. Prokofiev or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what is that? It's a Tam Tam beater, I'm pretty sure. Wow. We call it Leatherface. And so that's just covered in leather. What's inside? Felt? Okay, sometimes you just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's beautiful. So you literally tune it by pushing those little leather things back and forth. Yeah. Wow. We use those for our uh, snare drums where we sling them uh, yeah. and we play bohem on stage. So you play. <laughs> it actually doesn't sound that bad. Could be worse. So that's playing right in the middle, basically. 
Yeah. Wow. Cool. No, Let's see this USA thing here. There really isn't much color. The aforementioned <laughs> random steel things and the aforementioned pencils. pencils. So let's hear what Matt has to say about mental practice and what he calls the pre-shot routine. Matt Howard, you are the man. You just won principal of LA, you're 26. I am. What do you feel like are the biggest, were the biggest breakthroughs that you had leading up to the audition that changed, that made this one different? I think it was diving into the mental game of okay. audition more so than the technical. Cause I spent a lot of time just practicing and repeating excerpts and doing all that. Never really spent too much time in the mental side. So I started reading more books. And also at the same time, because I was in Florida, I started a habit of golfing. So I started getting into sports psychology books and golfing and came across a book called Golf is Not a Game of Perfect by Dr. Bob Rotella. Totally changed my life with how I really? approached audition taking and playing in general. What aspect about the mental game did you learn in the book or in golf that you felt applied so well to percussion or auditioning? Well, I just never even realized the level that most of these athletes are performing at mentally is so far beyond where I thought the level was and that I could incorporate that in my, what I'm doing. Walk us through a year and a half ago, you knew the excerpts, you can play an audition. What exactly, what point in the audition or the preparation process did this mental stuff come into play? What, what's like a, one specific thing that you did? Well, the pre-shot routine. Okay. was one thing that what, I... What is that? Well, it's a set routine that I did for each instrument, and I've gone through trial and error, and just I found that uh, this certain routine worked every time uh, playing that certain instrument, and making sure that the timing that I spent through it was consistent. You can get a routine and still mess it up by rushing through it or taking too long, but just having consistency through that was super helpful. We have the same teacher, Joe Pereira, who you play with now. He taught me a pre-shot routine for timpani. I mean, everyone needs to do this before timpani because you tune. He would have me go down below the pitch or all the way down, tap or flick or whatever, bring it all the way back up to the pitch and then tap it again. I know that's not like an actual full pre-shot routine. Mm -hmm. How does it look for cymbals? How does it look for snare drum for you? What is it, what is it like? Well, just I think understanding the goal is really important. So just knowing that the purpose of this is to get yourself calibrated to the instrument as fast and as efficiently as possible. So for cymbals, I mean, it could be different for everyone. For me, it was the longer I stood up and thought about it and held the cymbals, the more tired your arm's gonna get because they're heavy. They're heavy okay. cymbals. So I right. had to think about a routine that would accommodate that. So whereas like snare drum, it could be anything. So I just needed to make sure that the stick beads were calibrated to the drum head that I was playing on. And uh, I, I, I wouldn't even have to look at the drum. Once everything is set up the way it should be, you just play. So how do you do that on snare drum? Put the sticks at the edge of the drum on the rim. and On the rim? Okay. On the rim. Do you have moleskin there? Or? I do. Okay. I do. I mean, also have to understand that my routine about going about snare drum is based on my extensive work with technique and all these things and grip yeah. and making sure that that's already taken care of so I don't think about that while I'm doing this routine. But of course, the routine is pretty simple. Yeah, put it on the rim, scoot it up, lift off the head and play. Not too much time of thinking. The beads of the sticks go on the rim, right. then you pull them onto the head? Or I'm sorry, they go on the inside part of the rim. Oh, I see, on the head, uh, yeah. in, inside the rim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you scoot them back to, to the playing position. Maybe maybe I would just right above the uh, crown on a Remo head. In that way, you're able to feel the tension of the stick into the head, how tight the head is, the weight of the stick, how your fingers are pushing into the stick. Mm -hmm. and then you just pull off and play? Yeah, I mean, another thing, you know, if it's a soft excerpt like KJ or Scheherazade or something, I would um, maybe add a tiny uh, double stopped buzz roll at the very edge of the drum so that I, my fingers get the feeling of bounce, of the, the feeling of the head, so it's not audible. So you literally play an inaudible buzz with both hands on the very edge so that no one can hear it. Your, like your fingers stick. immediately feel the head and yeah. how, how it's gonna respond. What if someone hears you? I, I practice it to make sure no one would. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how does it look on cymbals? I would make sure that my left hand is my constant cymbal. Okay. So get my left hand situated, holding it and everything, getting the right angle, put it against my uh, stomach, slide the other one over it as quietly as possible, no sound, put the cymbals together, put the cymbals out. I've already thought about how far away the cymbals need to be. Yeah. And I just drop my left hand. Drop the left hand, that's fascinating. We were both at New World and we both developed this cymbal routine and hearing you talk about it, it is exactly what I do, <laughs> exactly. Put the left one against my chest, slide the right one on inaudibly, bring them out and play. I never thought of the dropping the left hand, but maybe I should do that 
for my next audition. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How did you develop those? A lot of trial and error. All the stuff was comfortable to me. There's some people that don't even need pre-shot routines, you know, they just are really good at just executing. Yeah. But for me, this was the most consistent way of doing it. Yeah. So, you know, some people might be more extensive. Some people might have nothing. You decide on a pre-shot routine, which is basically like what golfers do right before they're about to hit the, the ball, oh, yes. right? What are theirs like? Imagine shooting a th free throw or a bowler. They, they all have routines that they have to do. It's like a ritual. The, the batting stance. Too. Exactly. Yeah. Something that they that they do that they trust and they're comfortable executing and they know that they're going to perform at their best every time. So a golfer, you know, it might be like blink twice, touch their left pocket and then blink their one eye or something and then yeah. go over and take a certain amount of time to think about something and then swing. I like uh, Big Poppy's routine where he spits on his hands, <laughs> claps, and then he's ready. Yeah. Somehow that makes him ready. See? <laughs> Different for everyone. Yeah, it's kind of personal, I yeah. guess. From the time you realized you needed to do this to when you developed pre-shot routines for all the instruments and excerpts, how long did that take? It took a while. It took, I mean, through trial and error, I mean, probably took around a month to really finalize everything. So that was different between the LA audition and all your other auditions. Yeah. So that was really a game changer. I mean, first off, I had to really commit to this. It wasn't something that I wanted to try dabble in. It was something that I really, because of this sports psychology book, I really just wanted to try full bore and give it a chance. So you have a different routine for each instrument. What about different excerpts? If it's something a little bit more challenging, as I said, for Scheherazade, if you want to, I uh, just wanted to feel the drum head a bit. For Rachmaninoff, I kind of back off on the strap a little bit to let the, the cymbal breathe a little bit more. Xylophone, say for Porgy, for instance, I knew for the pre-shot routine exactly what octave to set up in, where my eyes should be looking at certain times. So you have this plan for every excerpt. It's not like on Scheherazade, twirl the stick, and on like Kiji, you like crouch to your knees and then back up. It's not, <laughs> they're not like crazy different. No. It's all like basically slight variations on your, your general snare drum pre-shot routine. As much as you can have the same general pre-shot routine for everything, it would probably be best, but just variations for each instrument. So like mainly timing, how fast each instrument. You take, you put the sticks down, you put the cymbals together. I think the consistency of that is really key. The frank idea of counting out the uh, amount of time that the cymbals come up here. So that's like the visual element, which affects sound, but also affects the perception of people watching you. Yeah. How much did you videotape yourself for A this lot. audition? A lot. Really? Because you lot. knew the screen would be down. Yeah. Is that why? I mean, that's the end, that's the goal. Because I've gotten to finals two times before that. I was at the point where I was, I needed that extra step. Yeah. I, ne I couldn't think about, oh, I'll get there when I, when I cross that bridge, you know? Yeah. I had to, I wanted to just forget about it. Right. It's already being worked on. Dude, you're an inspiring man. Thank you so much. Thank I appreciate you. it. All right, let's be done. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you this. What do you do right before the excerpt is starting? How do you practice the pre-shot routine? What's your pre-shot routine? Do you have one? Is that something that you should be working on? Maybe you should think about buying that book that Matt recommended and starting to think about how to mentally prepare your excerpts in order to do better at auditions. Let me know in the comments what kind of mental practice you do and then you can read what other people are doing down there as well. And if you're starting to implement this method or if you've worked on this method before, let me know in the comments because I wanna hear from you. If you wanna know kind of what I I do about audition preparation. I have this five-step audition preparation guide called the Audition Cheat Sheet. You can get it at robnopper.com slash audition cheat sheet. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up below and uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel. I'll be coming back at you with some more audition stuff in the next coming weeks and I will see you next time. Thank you so much for watching.